by the Committee on Guam, U.S. Military Relocation, Public Safety, and Judiciary is hereby convened. We do have three pieces of legislation that will be entertained this afternoon in the following order, Bill Number 197, which is relative to extending the duties of the Guam Police Department Community Assisted Policing Effort CAPE volunteers to include event supervision of the 12th SPAC of Pacific Arts, sponsored by Speaker Wampad, uh, T.C. Ada, and T.R. Munya Barnes. Bill number 198-33 LS, which is relative to creating the Uniform Interstate Enforcement of Domestic Violence Protection Orders, sponsored by Senator B.T. McCready. And then we will conclude with bill number 215-33 COR, relative to recognizing the successful rehabilitation and treatment of individuals convicted of first offender drug cases between 1998 and 2005, sponsored by Vice Speaker DJF Cruz and Majority Leader R.J. Respicio. As we proceed with this uh, public hearing, I'd like to recognize the members of the committee and the members of the legislature that are here. Vice Speaker B.J. Cruz, thank you very much, Mr. Vice Speaker, for joining us. Uh, Senator Rory Spicio, Senator Mary Torres, and Senator Tony Ada. Thank you, Senators, again for joining us this afternoon. As was highlighted, uh, we will commence with Bill Number 197-33. Uh, one other piece of item, first of all, for notification and compliance with the Open Government Law. The initial notification on this particular public hearing was disseminated on December 22nd, and then the second notices were disseminated on December 28th. So if anyone would like copies of, of the messages that were disseminated to the stakeholders and to the community, as well as the print apps, by all means, contact my, my office. Aside from that, we'll proceed with the pieces of legislation, Bill Number 197. We do have two individuals, and if there are any other individuals in the audience, who would like to provide testimony, please uh, approach the desk outside the public hearing room and sign in, and, and we'll proceed and recognize you. I'd like to invite Chief Joseph Cruz, Guam Police Department. Please, Chief, if you can join us, and Major Fred Chagla. And was, as was mentioned a little earlier, this is Bill Number 197-33, sponsored by Speaker Wampad. I'd like to recognize the Vice Chair of the Community, Senator Tom Adder. Thank you very much, Senator, for joining us this afternoon. Uh, she, Speaker Wampa did provide a written statement, and it, is, it reads as follows. The 12th Festival of Pacific Arts Fest Pack is to be held in Guam in 2016. A delegation of 2,500 performers, artists, and cultural practitioners is expected, in addition to thousands of visitors from Asia. The Guam Police Department will need assistance from the K program to assist with traffic direction, security, and crowd control. Currently, the K volunteers do provide this service during the Guam Coco Road Race, the Guam Micronesia Island Fair, and the Liberation Day Parade. This bill will extend their responsibilities to include this very significant event. So that's the uh, statement, public statement by the sponsor of the legislation that we are entertaining right now, Bill number 197. And Chief, if you can identify yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Good afternoon. My name is Joseph Cruz, and I'm the Chief of Police for the Guam Police Department. Buenas and off day. Before I get started with my testimony, I would like to wish each and every one here this afternoon a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. On behalf of the men and women of the Guam Police Department, I hereby submit this testimony in support of Bill Number 197-33 to amend subsection 77302 of Article 3, Chapter 77, Title 10, Guam Code Annotated, relative to extending the duties of the Guam Police Department Community Assisted Policing Effort, CAPE Volunteers, to include event supervision of the 12th Annual Festival of the Pacific Arts, FESPAC. As the Guam Police Department moves forward on providing timely and reliable service to our island and its residents, this piece of legislation will further our organization's efforts. In light of the department's fiscal constraints, additional duties that will be afforded to our CAPE volunteers would allow our full-time police officers to focus their time on their statutory mandates. We are in full support of Bill 197-33. However, we recommend that the specific events indicated in this proposed bill be removed and refed and amended to reflect, quote, that the Cape Volunteers be allowed to augment the Guam Police Department's police force during all GPD sanctioned events, end quote. 
by allowing the Guam Police Department to utilize our CAPE volunteers in all our sanctioned events and not just for those events previously listed. This would help us further meet our end state of better serving and protecting our island community. Senator Ogun and members of the community, I would like to thank you for your, the opportunity to provide comments on behalf of the Guam Police Department regarding this proposed bill. We respectfully request that the aforementioned recommendations be considered and included in the bill. Again, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Thank you very much, Chief Cruz, for your testimony this afternoon. Major Chagla? Yes, good afternoon, uh, Senators. And uh, my name is Major Fred Menabusan Chagliff. I'm the Operations Bureau Chief for the Guam Police Department. And just to kind of reiterate what uh, the Chief was mentioning is that we are, in fact, supportive of this bill. And the key aspect there is by not just uh, putting out specific events, what this recommendation by putting all sanctioned events is for other future events that might come up that's not necessarily either being uh, done on island or if it does come forward, then by, by putting all GPD sanctioned events, it'll allow our department, as the chief mentioned, to meet our needs. And what that does, like you said, is it'll allow the officers that are the full-time officers to focus on their, their duties, whereas the CAPE volunteers, and I'm going to give an example, like if, you know, if they're um, mechanics or let's say they're heavy equipment operator, and if they're, if they're needed for FESPAC or any other event, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're just going to be tied down to securing FESPAC, but any event that we deem necessary, whether it be, you know, the Liberation Parade or others. So this bill, and, you know, um, the chief has used this term before, it becomes a force multiplier for us. And what that does is, like the chief mentioned, it, it meets our end state and it allows us to actually not just provide security, but other, you know, uh, things that might not necessarily be law enforcement or police related. It could be, like I said, supporting our, our administration uh, division or support division folks. But more importantly, it will allow them to do what you're all uh, wanting to push for the bill, but also extending it to any and all of our, our GPD sanctioned events. Thank you. Thank you very much, Major Chargla. Senators, any questions or inquiries or comments? Yes, Senator Tom Adams. I was following you along, uh, Major Chargla, and, and you kind of lost me, that if, if these volunteers, or let's say their full-time jobs are mechanics, that you, they're basically, that you would then utilize them by your comments, you would utilize them in the mechanic shop. That, so I was just trying to follow what you're saying. Yes, and again, you know, um, what, like I said, is it'll allow these guys to, you know, assist our organization, you know, again, for all our sanctioned events. So if they're, you know, if a vehicle goes down while they're providing, you know, uh, assistance to the department, then we can utilize them because they'll have those skill sets. Would you do the same uh, for another officer if he had mechanic skills? Would you take him out of that uniform and, and put him in the mechanic shop? You know, that's and I'm, that's going to be at the discretion of the chief. Well, I mean, I mean, that's basically what you're suggesting. Well, I'm suggesting for the CAPE volunteers because they're just volunteers. So what, what the volunteers currently do, they just have their enforcement duties, which is um, dealing with the um, accessible parking violations as well as littering. So the bill that you're... That um, this legislature is trying to propose is extending it to security but if we allow them to do other um, you know other tasks when we have a GPD sanctioned event then and then it also if there's another um, another event that's like I said not currently being done now and it happens in the future then we'll, it will allow us to not just use them for you know security aspects but you know things that they might be able to provide uh, Chief Cruz maybe you care to elaborate Thank you, Senator. I will tell you that uh, the intent of the law, as indicated in subsection 77302, is for our CAPE volunteers to provide uh, security-centric or security-oriented uh, functions to support the Guam Police Department. In particular, the Chief of Police is, is authorized to recruit for the enforcement of accessible parking and littering laws, number one. Number two, the Chief of Police is allowed to recruit for volunteers to patrol the campuses of GDOE. That's number two. And then number three is that the Chief of Police can uh, recruit 
volunteers for traffic direction, security, and crowd control for such events as listed by the chairman of the committee. So to that end state, I will tell you, Senator, that it is my intent as the chief of police, while although the, our volunteers would have additional skill sets because it's what they do in in uh, what they do on a full-time basis, it is my intent to stay within the spirit of the law and the spirit of the law is to use them for, for security-centric missions. Uh, what, what the major was alluding to is for functions, particularly, take for example, our CAPE volunteers are all EVOC certified, Emerging Vehicle Operators course. So we could use them hypothetically for traffic direction, which still meets the intent and the spirit of the law. We could hypothetically use them for desk watch duty. And we've done that in the past with some of our civilians just to augment our full-time officers because of the shortage of manpower. In this case, it's security-centric. Again, they could assist uh, the full-time force in that manner. Would I, per se, as the chief of police, take them and put them in a mechanic shop? Not necessarily. Uh, I would take it on a case-by-case -case basis. In the event that it, if, if it came down to that, uh, to consider that, but I would say up front and in a, of itself, uh, my intention is to use the CAPE volunteers uh, in accordance with the, what, what the law specifically affords me to be able to recruit for CAPE volunteers. So to that end, Senator, I will tell you that it is my intent to use them uh, in the department to augment other tasks aside from what's specifically indicated in subsection 77 or 77302, keeping uh, within the spirit of the law so that they, they stay um, security centric if you will and I appreciate your clarifying that and I, I I that's a new term for me security centric and I'm, I think that clarifies it yes sir um, there, there's just one other question that I have and that is you would like to broaden it to augment GPD uh, during all GPD sanctioned events so what other events occur on a relatively recurring basis uh, other than Coco Road Rays, the the uh, Liberation Day Parade, etc., that you can think of, maybe just a couple. Well, a, a good a good example is uh, augmenting the neighborhood watch program. Um, our Cape volunteers go out there, and they uh, would augment uh, the neighborhood watch program to go out there and assist the village mayors as they go throughout the village in in accessible parking and littering but also to provide traffic directions. Take for example, you see many funerals uh, on our island. Right now, the mayor's office is providing that escort service. Um, being, having our CAPE volunteers who are uh, EVOC certified and traffic direction certified can go out there and, and do their voluntary, uh, volunteer service in the community by helping the neighborhood watch program, helping the village mayors, so things of that nature. There are other major events, there are other um, Marathons, there are other races that happen on the island, separate and apart from the Coco Race, the Micronesian Island Fair, there's the Icadin, there's the Perimeter Relay, there's a myriad of, of races that are mandated by Guam law to, that, that, the, that we have to provide security for. Uh, those are the type of events, Senator, that I would like to use our CAPE volunteers for. And, and, and that's fine. And if your recommendation is to make it broader, maybe we should qualify that, though, by... Uh, by adding in that qualifier that that you know the additional duties will be as you put it uh, security, security centric. centric yes yes and, and I would feel more comfortable with that sure uh, than knowing that you know it's a possibility that these guys can end up in mechanic shop I, and, and that just caught my attention okay yes sir All right, thank you and Senator, I just want to be clear also because one of the things that my staff had brought to my attention was the fact that uh, using them to augment at, at something like a desk watch or up at our tact tactical communication section where they would dispatch. All those uh, positions at, tactical, at our tactical communication section are all law enforcement dispatchers, they're civilians. So using a CAPE volunteer in that fashion would also kind of foot the bill because of the fact that it's security centric, it's providing uh, a police type service to the community uh, versus that of a mechanic or, or what have you. So. So I, I will take a look at that and, and try and include that uh, in, the, in my written testimony um, that I can follow up as a supplement uh, to qualify, as you say, um, my testimony to include those specific big ticket items uh, that we would need help from our CAPE volunteers to include uh, things like um, funeral escorts, uh, uh, dispatching, uh, and the desk watch duties as well. 
You're welcome. Thank you very much, Senator Tom Allen, Chief Chief Speaker Wampat, did you want to inquire or ask any questions regarding your legislation? And then I will recognize Senator Torres. Fair enough. Not knowing, of course, what those uh, specifics are, I agree with uh, the previous uh, speaker <clears throat> that maybe something a little bit more broader uh, can be all-encompassing uh, because of, of, of just that fear. Uh, when, when we were doing this, I want you to know, though, that the 12th Festival of the Pacific Arts Fest Pack is really only going to happen uh, next year. So this is a one-time event. So it's and, and so maybe not even to to be this specific, but maybe to a man, as you uh, had indicated earlier, to be all encompassing just so long so we know that when FESPEC comes around, that we will be, you know, looking to the assistance, of course, of the, the CAPE uh, officials to be able to do this. So it's, it's only going to be a one-time thing because it's once every four years. Absolutely, Madam Speaker. And uh, we will definitely get that uh, included in our supplemental um, testimony that we'll be providing. Can I just ask you, I mean, uh, just briefly, I mean, knowing, of course, uh, and it's unfortunate, I know, or fortunate, I suppose, that at least we've heard that they've been very successful. And, and in the time that you've been in, have you found that this particular program has been beneficial also to the department? A absolutely, uh, Madam Speaker. I will tell you that, uh, that any help that we get uh, into the Guam Police Department is help that is uh, received with with open arms and i will tell you much of the cape volunteers have reached out to us wanting to assist the guam police department um so we see success in the program uh, we we see success in uh, their volunteer efforts to uh stay within the the spirit of the law by enforcing um accessible parking as well as littering but we see also that they want to do more and and so this falls in line with wanting to provide security for FESPAC but we see it uh, as it being even more beneficial by taking it a step further and making it encompass uh, other GPD function or sanctioned events. So we do see success, Madam Speaker, and we want to continue to build on that. And I think this will be a good conduit to want to recruit more volunteers into the Guam Police Department, uh, specifically more Cape volunteers. And, and based, of course, the only fines pr primarily now that you're able to, to generate are primarily from the littering fines, and I know that there was a bifurcation to assist with uh, persons with disabilities as well. Do you find that the funds that you have would be sufficient to continue now or to provide the additional training for more individuals who want to, per to volunteer? I will tell you that based on the analysis that we've done in the department and what I've been briefed, on the onset, we think that the, the fraction of the accessible parking and the littering violations that were coming to the D, uh, to the Guam Police Department uh, were, uh, so to speak, me, were assisting the program, and they were they were helping to provide training, uh, to provide a, a, a uniform, a quasi uniform, if you will, with a polo shirt and what have you. However, we've noticed that because of their success, that the amount of ha of accessible parking and littering has has gone down. And that's, that's to the success of the CAPE volunteers as well as our CVPR officers. So to that point, because we see a drop, the, the, the funding source coming in to feed that program also has diminished. So to answer your question up front, I will tell you that that funding source to be able to support the CAPE volunteer program is, is not, quite, not quite meeting the mark. So we're having to, to uh, be innovative in the management of our monies to be able to continue to train them on traffic direction, train them on uh, emergency vehicle operators course and what have you, so that they can meet the intent of, of what the law uh, indicates. So up front, I will say at this point in time, it's not sufficient and we're having to find uh, funding from within. On the onset, it was because uh, a lot of people, through no fault of their own, were taking advantage of the accessible parking. Now that we've uh, enforced that, uh, we see that people are now in compliance uh, of, of those laws, and we see the, the decline in those numbers. So uh, that, that's the perspective we have in the police department. 
and I appreciate you know knowing that, of course, because maybe that's something we need to look in as well. Yes, that Madam Speaker. Some of these other events that are where they're requesting the assistance of the CAPE officers that maybe there should be some type of uh, you know fee, so to speak, you know, to be able to assist. Not of course the per hourly rate, but definitely something that can continue to sustain the program because sure. then they'll be able to help the community. Sure. What I will tell you, Madam Speaker, is. For, for things like um, uh, police escorts and security, we do assess a fee. It's, it's part of, it goes into the police services fund. So there's, there's a fee schedule that's, that's listed right now, um, and it's been through the AAA process, so that schedule's there. Uh, we, let all the, the, we let the citizens know, uh, should they need uh, traffic direction assistance, should they need security assistance from the Guam Police Department, we assess those fees. Those fees uh, go automatically into the police services fund, which feed the police department. So specifically, we just need to find the monies from within that come from the police services fund to be able to provide training and a, a uniform for our CAPE volunteers. However, uh, as you indicated, if, we, if uh, funding would be made available or appropriated specifically for our CAPE volunteers and specifically for our CVPRs, that would definitely assist the Guam Police Department in their... They, being able to provide services to our community. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Speaker Wampa. Thank you, Chief Cruz. Senator Torch. Chief Cruz, very briefly, this the speaker captured a lot of the the thoughts that I had uh, that I was going to address. But uh, do you have a, an anticipation of what your volunteer needs would be, assuming FESPACT is your next target? Do you have a, a, an idea of how many re volunteers that you'd like to recruit? And if you do, do you have a, a corresponding um, fiscal impact that that would have for the, the, you mentioned the polos, and I imagine there's other credentials and other you know, minor equipment that they would have to be uh, outfitted with. Do you have, do you have a, a gauge of what that might be right now? Right now, in working with the governor's office, uh, the, the FESPAC executive director, uh, in having in, in speaking to her and, and um, just so that uh, the committee is aware I've been designated as the head of security for FESPAC so as a subcommittee as a safety and security subcommittee uh, chairperson um, it is my responsibility to ensure that the safety and security aspect for the the FESPAC when FESPAC comes to Guam is appropriate and, and that we do meet the safety and security needs specifically for the Guam Police Department what I've committed to FESPAC from, uh, from the, the personnel of the Guam Police Department is 60, uh, 60 officers, whether it be uniform officers, uh, full-time officers, uh, police reserves, or CAPE volunteers. I've committed 60 personnel. In taking a look at our operations and in, in realizing that we do need to continue to keep the entire island safe, but realizing the magnitude of FESPAC, what I'm saying is for the Guam Police Department specifically, 60 bodies is what I'm committing. In taking a look at that, um, we are looking at uh, appropriations or, or monies from within, as well as funding from the FESPAC committee to assist us on, in that. Now we're working collaboratively, collaboratively with the other local law enforcement agencies to be able to meet that end state. What I will tell you is uh, we are looking at that right now. I do not have for you at this point a dollar figure that I could attach. Uh, to that 60, but it is my intent to recruit more volunteers, get them trained up, uh, and, and get them the, the uh, minimum equipment that they would need to be able to augment that 60. So at this point in time, I'm looking at 60 either full-time officers or CVPRs to be augmented on top of that with the CAPE volunteers. So, so to answer your question of do I know a dollar figure at this point, I do not have a dollar figure uh, readily available for you for you at this time senator the first part was do you, do you even have a figure of how many how many people you'd like to get how many additional bodies like what is your cape force right now approximately uh, right volunteers? now i believe eight eight right now okay. ca eight cape volunteers so you're looking on to our double boats. that you're looking to triple well, that's that? what we're looking we're looking to at least double the cape volunteer force okay, okay but again I, I just want to be clear 60 police officers uh, is what i'm looking at committing to the the uh, fespac and that's only one. That's only one piece. There, there are other federal law enforcement agencies that will be involved in the security piece uh, for FESPAC. Okay, you're welcome. 
Thank you very much, Senator Tony. Senator Vespicio, and then Senator Tony. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Chair, Chief Major. Uh, good afternoon, and also to your uh, men and women in blue. Thank you for being here this afternoon. Absolutely. Thank you for your Merry Christmas message. So Thank Merry you. Christmas and Happy New Year as well. Thank you. You know, I appreciate your um, testimony, and uh, I've seen this piece of legislation evolve over the years, and this piece of this particular law amended over time to include the um, Guam Coco race, and I believe it was amended again to include the Micronesian Island Fair, and so your suggestion is certainly warranted that maybe if um, the legislation were more broad, that an event comes up that you wouldn't have to come back and amend the law. But I also recognize the sponsors of this legislation's intent to want to specifically make sure that the, the CAPE volunteers under the, your leadership uh, is, are going to be focused on the 12th festival of the Pacific of, of, for FESPAC. And so I'm, I'm asking if you'll follow me for a moment on page two, line seven, uh, after the takeout and, uh, so it says security crowd control, comma, and to augment the Guam Police Department's police force during all GPD sanctioned events to include but not limited to events such as, and then we keep everything in, uh, such as the Co Guam Coco Road Race, the Guam Micronesian Island Fair, the Liberation Day Parade, and the 12th Festival of the Pacific Arts for FESPAC. Because if, if, a, if this legislation went from wanting to make sure that FESPAC is going to be covered uh, to then the other extreme to amend it where you take all these events out and the support will prov be provided unless it's Chief ED sanction, what are the guarantees that come FESPAC uh, CAPE volunteers will be there? I know the guarantee is real and present because of your involvement in FESPAC, but yes. I just want to ask if it's possible as a possible compromise. And this also uh, takes into consideration uh, what you would need uh, and how you would need to augment your force from time to time. So I want to offer this as um, a recommendation to the chair as this bill continues to go okay. through uh, his committee and this legislative process. Senator, I, I, uh, I'm very much on board with, with the proposal that you had just mentioned now. Um, I think in mentioning it, I see your point, and I think that wanting to have a commitment specifically to FESPAC, uh, I, I can see that, but I can also see how you're including the uh, all GPD sanctioned events. So I think that would be the, that, that meets the intent of uh, what the amendment is, as well as the intent of the Guam Police Department in wanting to use CAPE volunteers above what's listed currently in this amendment. And it's a good, um, it's a good deliverable to the FESPAC committee. Uh, yes. That the legislature, uh, through, throughout the several months of providing for appropriations, and should uh, Speaker Wampat's bill pass and become law, this is another deliverable to the FESPAC committee saying that there's legislation specifically provided so that CAPE volunteers will be there. So I think it's a win-win. I'm glad Ab that you're open to it. Absolutely, Senator, and thank you for thank that you. recommendation. So I'll just submit this to the chair, and uh, sure. thank you for your support. Absolutely. You're welcome. Thank you very much, Senator Speech. Senator Tony Adam. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, Chief. Good uh, afternoon, Senator. I just wanted to know whether, you know, because uh, expanding the, the CAPE volunteers currently, um, when they'll be interacting with, with uh, people, with the best pack and things like that, what is the liability to the government? I mean, would, if a CAPE volunteer gets injured or they inadvertently injure an individual, it, would the government be held liable? And how do we keep... Uh, As it is right now, the Workmen's Compensation Act will be covered by our volunteers. That question has been brought up many times by our CVPRs. And, and the answer to that question is uh, they are comp they're covered under Workmen's Compensation. In this case, where a CAPE volunteer is working uh, as a CAPE volunteer under uh, executing their duties, trained by the Guam Police Department, under the auspices of the Guam Police Department, they would be covered under the Workmen's Compensation Act. So for liability in that, to that regard, th they would be covered. Uh, the reverse of that is if, if a CAPE volunteer were to do something, so long as they are functioning just like police officers or CVPRs uh, under the auspices and within the guidelines of how they were trained, traffic direction, uh, you know, operating that motor vehicle, so on and so forth, again, uh, they, they would be covered as well. So then would an amendment have to be made to specify that within the, or not, you know? I, I don't think, up front, Senator, I would say I don't think it does, but I could go back to my legal counsel and confer with my legal counsel just to be sure. Okay, and then on the expansion of CAPE, currently cur CAPE sites, vehicles that are parked 
Unexpected. They can only cite for accessible parking and littering. That's all they can cite for. Individuals or vehicles? They, if, there's a, is a, if there is an individual there mm -hmm. with that vehicle, the, the, the citation is given to the individual. However, nine times out of ten, the vehicle is parked without, uh, without the proper documentation there, whether it be a placard or a, uh, a license plate, the, the citation is written and left with the vehicle. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Senator Tony. Uh, Speaker Wampat has one follow-up question. Chief. Thank you. Yes, Madam Speaker. Um, I know recently there was uh, a notice of alert that was put out by Homeland Security, uh, primarily, I guess, as an advisory that whenever there is uh, going to be a gathering of a large number of people that, you know, they're asking the community to be on the alert, to be, you know, watchful. Because we are expecting about 2,700, you know, performers, artists, and artisans, and, and of course there's the traditional followers of about five to 800 of them. So, and GVB has been actively promoting this in Korea and, and Japan. So we really can anticipate a large number of people who will be here. So I'm just hoping then that with that advisory, there may be uh, special attention or um, training, you know, would be provided to the uh, CAPE officers as well then in preparation. And then not just them, of course, your officers as well. Absolutely, Madam Speaker. And we're, we're taking that into consideration uh, to make sure that they are trained and they're ready to deal with the volume of uh, residents and visitors that will be uh, taking part in the FESPAC uh, festivities. So we are taking a look at that, Madam Speaker. We are aware of the, uh, of the threat assessments that are being provided by Homeland Security in the Fusion Center, the Marianas uh, Fusion Center. So we are taking all that into consideration and we're making sure that our full-time force, our CVPRs, as well as our CAPE volunteers are trained uh, to adequately uh, deal with the threat and, and deal with the uh, volume of residents and, and uh, visitors that will be uh, coming to our island. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Speaker Wampat and Chief Cruz and Major Chagla. Thank you very much, and to all you men and women in blue, uh, thank you for your presence this afternoon, and likewise, Merry Christmas and a happy holidays to all of you. Absolutely. Happy, happy New Year. Thank we you. We will proceed, you, ladies and gentlemen, with the next legislative measure that's on the agenda, Bill Number 198. And, and as I invite the following individuals to take a seat at the table, I, I would like to recognize uh, one of the senators in terms of uh, providing a brief with regards to this piece of legislation. And if I can invite Mr. Eric Miller, Phil Taidinko, and Richard Dirks. If there's anyone else in the audience who would like to provide testimony, please your mother welcome to sign up and join us at the table. This is bill number 198, which is relative to creating the Uniform Interstate Enforcement of Domestic Violence Protection Orders Act sponsored by Senator McCready and Senator Tony Anna has been asked by Senator McCready to, to provide the opening statement. Senator? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, on behalf of Senator McCready, he uh, regrets that he wasn't able to be here today as he's still currently off island. Uh, Bill 198.33 seeks to adopt the Uniform Interstate Enforcement of Domestic Violence Protection Orders Act, which establishes uniform procedures for the enforcement of domestic violence protection orders across state lines. Adopting this act will mean that Guam courts and law enforcement must enforce all terms of, the, of valid protection orders from other states and territories until the order expires. An individual may register a protection order in the Superior Court of Guam, and this registration will help facilitate effective enforcement of the order by law enforcement officers. A law enforcement officer, upon finding probable cause that an order has been violated, must enforce the order. The act has been adopted in at least 18 states and two territories. The issue of enforcement discrepancies of protection orders from other states was brought to Senator McCready's attention by Chief Prosecutor Phil Tidenko, who has much knowledge and experience regarding this. Seeing its urgency and importance for victims of domestic violence, especially for those looking to come back to Guam and escape from domestic abuse, Senator McCready readily, readily introduced this legislation in October which was opportune as the month was declared Domestic Violence Awareness Month by President Barack Obama. And although current law, which was passed almost two decades ago, allows for individuals to register a protection order with the Superior Court, 
as pointed out as pointed out by the judiciary bill 198 does not require registration of the order to enforce it as stated on page 5 line 7 this is what differentiates bill 198 from current law it addresses the non-judicial enforcement of protection orders by specifically providing law enforcement officer, officers rules of enforcement as outlined on page 4 line 13 to page 5 line 8. Bill 198 adds another layer of protection for victims of domestic violence and removes a layer of bureaucracy. As Bill 198 further protects officials from civil and criminal liability as in for enforcement of a protection order if they act in good faith and most importantly provides for a more comprehensive approach in the enforcement of protection orders and current law fails to address non-judicial enforcement. An amendment to Bill 198 to reconcile or repeal, or repeal current law almost two decades old is forthcoming and hopefully we'll be able to see those amendments and uh, work with the committee and the chairman uh, for a markup on this. Um, on behalf of Senator McCready, he thanks you all very much for being here and for providing your testimony on Bill 198.33. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Senator Tony Adam. I take your feel they're all looking in your direction. The Office of Attorney General, so... <laughs> yes, please, if you can identify yourself with the okay, record. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Uggen. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Speaker uh, Wampad, Senator Tom Adams, uh, Vice Speaker B.J. Cruz. Senator Respicio, Senator Torres, and Senator Tom Madden. Also present with me is uh, Janice Camacho, as staff counsel to the Attorney General. On behalf of Attorney General Barrett Anderson and the Office of Attorney General, uh, we, we urge the legislature to support uh, this, uh, this proposed bill. I think it allows this jurisdiction to join 18 others in uh, uh, adding this statute uh, to its books in order to have enforcement that includes, again, Notwithstanding the fact that we do have on the books um, in uh, Title 19, Chapter 14, the, uh, the registration of, of civil protection orders, what this provides, and it's a lot more comprehensive, uh, is a, an opportunity for for a person who can show with probable cause that they have a, uh, a uh, protective protection order invo involving a domestic violence uh, to be enforced by uh, an officer without having to do the whole registration. and. And you know that whole process ordinarily requires obtaining counsel and waiting for the courts to open and so forth and so on. And in addition, the statute also and the statute also provides some uh, civil immunity protections, uh, that's, which is not which is absent or present in the uh, in the uh, current statute of uh, Chapter 14, uh, Title 19, which which of course was good for its day because that was enacted by the 24th Palm Legislature nearly. Uh, 20 years ago or so. Uh, and in fact, to be consistent with that chapter, I, I think the only amendment that I would probably offer is on um, page 5 under the 16105 registration order line 10 where it says it also has a registration uh, section that perhaps we should add an amendment to subsection A that says any individual may register their form protection order in this state under 19 GCA chapter 14 or under the section allows either one that way you don't have to impliedly or explicitly repeal that other one but this is a lot more comprehensive and so uh, we ask that you consider uh, uh, enacting this this bill thank you thank you very much mr Jaginko. tony miller i'm sorry can you pull up the mic Good afternoon. My name is Eric Miller. I'm the Executive Director of the Public Defender Service Corporation. We are very concerned about protecting the victims of domestic violence. I think the statute is well intended and it will do a lot to help those victims, especially those traveling from other jurisdictions. Um, I'm going to defer to my colleague, Mr. Dirks. There is a unique unintended consequence of, to the statute and has to do with the content of Guam's order of protection law. So with your permission, if we could, if I could defer to Mr. Dirks to point out this issue. Thank you very much, Attorney Miller. Attorney Dirks. Good afternoon, Senators. I appreciate this opportunity to have some input. Um, 
I appreciate that the law that we've been functioning under is about 20 years old, uh, but I don't know that it's broke or that it needs to be fixed. I, um, the public defender has been providing protective orders for people for 40 years. Before there was a family violence law in our criminal code, before protective orders were called protective orders. Uh, since 1995, we've had a federal grant to help provide this service to victims. We have a specialist in our office. And we, like Guam Legal Services, can usually provide one-day service in getting a protective order. <clears throat> we see out-of-jurisdiction or, out orders in roughly two different types of cases. And my concern is for the unintended consequences for a person coming back to Guam to avoid an abusive relationship in the states, especially if they're coming back, especially if there are children involved, especially if they don't have money. Guam, like most jurisdictions, has provided mechanisms to provide, to provide protective orders for free. Uh, we even have a, a a kiosk over at the court so that people can get them themselves if they don't uh, want to uh, avail themselves of Guam Legal Services or us. A similar thing is going on in the states. It's very easy for a person to walk in, apply for a protective order. The protective order can cover the, app, the petitioner. It can cover any children who are in the petitioner's custody or who are alleged to be in the petitioner's custody. And the order can go into place by a judge who has heard the full proceeding. It can go into place because one side didn't show up for the hearing. And different states have different procedures on what is necessary to prove you gave notice to the other side. And herein lies the problem. Uh, for a person fleeing another U.S. jurisdiction, coming back here and seeking to register their out of their off Guam protective order, I think the law we have now functions quite well. At least in 25 years, I have never had a client come in and say the court wouldn't register it, the police won't enforce it. Usually, when they're coming back with a foreign order, they are leaving the other party beside, behind. My concern is for the ones who flee without an off-island without an off-island protective order, come back here to rejoin their families and leave a relationship that might not even be a marital one. Uh, I'd like to focus on two problems. One is. Uh, Copy. There we go. <clears throat> On uh, the bottom of um, 16103, which is the third page of the order, about the middle at subsection C, this law expressly provides that Guam has to enforce any provisions of a valid foreign protection order which govern custody and visitation, which means that any custody decision made about the children will be controlled by the off-island order even if the children are here. This will strip the Guam court of jurisdiction to examine the custody issue. Now, we have to make a, there's a fine determination to be made here. If the custody order is a valid order in a domestic case from the states, we have to enforce it anyway because of the Uniform Child Custody Jurisdiction Act. If, however, it is something obtained in a protective order where the judicial supervision in the states will not be as careful as it is in a domestic case and certainly not as careful as it is in our courts here, there is the danger that a person returning here will um, be facing a custody determination 
that was made as a result of an ex parte application in another <laughs> jurisdiction. To make things worse, our, our local protective order uh, statute does not allow our judges to grant permanent custody or visitation as part of the protective order process. So if, if the lady comes here with her children, gets a protective order because she's afraid of the man coming from off island, the judge will grant her temporary custody, temporary visitation, but he current law does not allow Guam ju judges to grant her anything more. If meanwhile, the father or other parent of the children in the states applies for a protective order and under their law gets a grant of custody, our court here has to enforce the off-island order and our court here is powerless to help this lady even though she may have the children here. In fact, even though the children may never have left island, if the couple leaves off island and the children are here, um, they might have been here all the time. The Guam court should have control over that. The Guam court should have some power to, um, to uh, act in the best interests of the children. Then there's one other provision that I think is especially troublesome, especially um, in combination with the one we just examined. On, at the bottom of the same page, one of the requirements is in the case of an order ex parte, in other words, an order obtained by one person without notice to the other, the respondent, who will be the person here on Guam, was given notice and has had or will have an opportunity to be heard, which means she comes back with the children, application is made off island, she gets notice here that there's a hearing in Dallas in six days. Our court under this law will be required to enforce the Texas order rather than the con considering her application before the Guam court, even though she might have applied first. Um, and and that, that's my concern. There's no requirement that she actually have had an opportunity to be heard before the order was entered. All that's required is that we receive an off-island order. She has an opportunity to be heard somewhere under the U.S. flag. That's enough. Guam has to enforce it. So if she gets an ex parte order saying she's ordered to stay away from the children, the Texas court may have no idea the children have always been here with her. They are entirely reliant on what the applicant back there is telling them. And I know our intention here is to protect victims, but our courts sort out the real victims, the real petitioners, from the ones who are trying to do this because it can be a four person's divorce. If I have the car and I have the kids this weekend and I file for a protective order, I've got what I want. The other side now has to hire a lawyer. Um, and then the other, the other thing at the beginning, um, it's made clear that the Guam court has to enforce these orders should this grant be should this act, this bill be passed, even if our local court does not have the power to grant that same relief. So it makes it very clear that even if our local judges in a protective order application do not have the power to make permanent custody decisions, it makes it very clear that that same judge who can't grant relief to the person in front of him is required to follow the order from off island, even though there may not have been a final hearing. This is a complicated thing to untangle, but I, I hope that we will carefully consider the needs of Guam litigants when we look at this. 
it's a good thing to have orders enforced nationwide, but our folks here face a special problem when they're told to appear in a court thousands and thousands of miles away. It's not like driving from Iowa to Minnesota for a year. And this specifically allows custody determinations, and um, that can cause a lot of pain and hardship unless uh, it's done carefully. I hope that uh, the final draft of this bill, if we pass it, um, will take into consideration the possibility of letting our local judges have some uh, authority to do the right thing in unusual facts when they come to. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for your testimony this afternoon, Attorney Dirksen. I'm certain, confident that the committee is going to look at the guidance coming from both offices as it reports this particular version out with any amendments that will be intact because we certainly want to continue to be on the side of the victim and ensuring that whatever circumstances are that you representing these individuals will be able to make the best decisions hopefully in, in their stead. So I appreciate your testimony this afternoon. Senators, any questions or comments? Mr. Vice Speaker? Thank you very much for your testimony, Richard, because I was concerned about that too. And because when we passed the um, Custody Act, I, we, we worked out some of those those kinks yeah, when we did that about six, six or eight years ago. But I think just for my colleagues to completely understand, what could happen is husband and wife could be living in the States, and as you're, you're using as an example, the children can be living here with grandma. They have a fight in Tennessee. She wants to get out of the abusive relationship. She jumps on a plane and flies back here. He knows where she's going to go, and he's following her back here. Before he leaves Nashville, he goes and he applies for protective order. He gets custody of the children who have never lived in Tennessee. And he flies to Guam with a protective order. There had been no hearing. It was ex parte. Or she even even if it wasn't ex parte, if it was that she could she could fly back in March for a hearing, she has an opportunity to be able to present her side. But between now and March, the local court will have to enforce the Tennessee order, which is to give custody to the allegedly abusive parent and the children have to be flown back to Tennessee. That's entirely correct. And if she can't afford the trip, she'll then lose she's the, kid. like she, she'll she lose the kids forever. That's exactly the problem. I'm, I'm glad you're one of the good guys. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Vice Speaker. Any other questions or comments? And so are we. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. We're, <laughs> what, I'm, what, I'm, what I'm saying, though, is that there, there are attorneys who will help an unscrupulous person who wants to take the kids away walk through this minefield. And they can get an order without the other side. If substituted service is allowed, they will serve her by sending the papers to the place she moved out of a week ago. The husband or ex-boyfriend knows it, but if it's, if it's adequate service under the local law back there, that's what he'll do. I'd just like to make sure that our judges here, who I would say in almost every case, are more careful and have them better connected to the community, are going to make a very good decision. And I'd just like them to have some power to do so. Thank you very much again. Thank you, Rita. Any questions or comments on this proposal? If not, Thank you very much Thank for your testimony this afternoon. I take it the three of you will be remaining in that seat. Uh, with, with I, your I do have to leave, unfortunately, okay. because... Uh, I do have Judge uh, Mayor LaGuardia. Please, if you can join us up front. <coughs> Attorney Miller, uh, Mr. Tidenko. I apologize. Presiding Judge Alberto Lamarena was in the audience for an extended period of time, and he just walked out because he has an obligation. So I apologize. Next time around, let, let the chair know, and we'll try to rearrange the schedule. 
Okay, we have Mr. Josh Tenorio, incidentally, folks, who is uh, celebrating his birthday today. But Mr. Tenorio, you can join us up front. Uh, Daniel Rossetti and Dana Gutierrez. If you, okay. Okay. Also, just for the record, um, the Judiciary of Guam did submit testimony for Bill Number One Ninety Eight, so that has been entered into the record. And for purposes of this particular public hearing and, and any of the pieces of legislation that are being entertained today, I would like to uh, share with the public that the committee will continue to receive written testimony through close of business on Monday, the 5th of January. Should any of the sponsors want to have this reported out of the committee, uh, then the, commi the committee will continue to receive public written testimony on any of these pieces of legislation through the close of business on Monday. So that will give uh, our people out at least an extra six days, seven days to be able to provide testimony. Aside from that, uh, Mayor Laguane, you want us to go ahead and proceed with you first? Yes, I'm the senior citizen here, so I have the right to go in front. <laughs> first of all, uh, Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year for each and every one of you, Senator. Let me start with my criminal history. When I was just turned 18, I committed assault and battery. I was sentenced for 30 days in jail. I just turned 18. I was a gangster. I was part of the leader beating up people in the street. I served my time, but none of my gang never came and visited me. The only person that came was my mom. My gang never came. When I got out, I made up my mind that it's not the right way. So I turned around and ran as president for the bar first Barrigada Youth Club, Barrigada Popular Party, and I was active in all the community affairs in Barrigada. Even the Christian mother meeting, I was there helping the Christian mother. I even testified in front of you though to elect our first Washington delegate. I even testified in front of Congressman Yodo to elect our governor and lieutenant governor. I was the only youth at that time testifying to elect make the people of Guam elect the company. The people of Arigada only took six years for them to forgive me. I got elected as the vice mayor or the assistant commissioner of Barigada in 78. I committed a crime in 72. It took them only six years to give me that opportunity to serve as their vice mayor. And I had even more vote than the mayor running with me. It was a good opportunity for them to give me that. Now that I have a crime against myself, I didn't commit it with anybody, it's against myself. It took the government 17 years to recognize that crime that I did. I tried going to the governor, but when you're a politician, it takes a good governor to pardon another politician. They never always say, don't worry, God, the I'll do it, I'll do it. His term passed and he never does it. But now is the time that it's here. I hope that you guys understand that out of all the crimes, I had only two. People get pardoned by the governor that has 15 crimes in their hand and worse crime than what I did. But now that we have this bill, the time that I did my crime, the opportunity for you to go to rehab, go to everything. I did everything that the rehab wants me to do. But I never get pardoned. Now that they have this law in 205, where after you finish your going to rehab and everything, your case is punched away from, and you get a chance to rehabilitate. It's good for me 
because I'm re I was retired before I committed a crime. And I'm living on my retirement now. But my body and my mind and my movement is too young. I still can go a long way. As what Dr. Titan said to me, you are a very strong patient. I told him, I said, God is with me. So I hope that you give me this opportunity. By, we don't have to go and um, give somebody hand to get pardon. The law says it, so do it. Thank you very much, and she just mercy. Thank you very much, Mayor Laguani. Before we proceed with the uh, birthday celebration, I'd like to recognize and apologize to the, the sponsor of the legislation, Vice Speaker Cruz, so that he can provide his comments. Thank you very much, actually. I'm glad that you started with Mayor, because he had come to see me before. He was one of the reasons why this legislation was introduced. I had been working on this since after 2006, when he came to speak to me about the fact that he has a record, and as he put it, it was a crime against himself. It was a victimless crime. It, it was a drug crime, but it was a victimless crime, and he, because of that on his record, he could not, uh, I mean, he, every time he went for a police clearance or a court clearance, it showed, and consequently affected his ability to be employed further. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, he was not the only one. I mean, I've, if literally over the last 10 years, hundreds of people have come to me about the fact that they wanted to have their records cleared because of issues. I even had one grandmother come in and, and, and see me crying because she was embarrassed. She had taken her 17-year-old granddaughter to go get a police clearance, and the granddaughter just said, Grandma, why don't you get a police clearance? And she applied for the police clearance and it showed that in the mid-60s, she had had a curfew violation, but it was on the record, and she was mortified, embarrassed that her granddaughter found out that grandma has a, has a police record, and she came crying into the office. But more importantly, Mr. Chairman, um, the intent of this is when we started to, to introduce this was not only because of the mayor, but because so many of these individuals who have a, at least for this case, for this bill, a, a drug offense, and it's their only offense that they've had, and they successfully completed the, the drug rehab program at the court, but it was before 2005, they could not get it expunged. And consequently, every time they go and apply for a job, they can't, they can't be hired. I've had contractors come and talk to me about the fact that they have really good um, craftsmen who they can't take onto the base because of the fact that they have, they, they can't get a police clearance. And um, there are many people who, though we try, we say our unemployment rate is down to 7%, and, but there are 60,000 people that aren't applying. A good number of those people that aren't applying or looking for a job are people that have completely given up. And we cannot give up on them. I know that Senator Mary Torres is considering a full-on full on, full on uh, do, uh, second chance bill, and I'm hoping that with the success of this one, that her bill will pass soon so that we can give other individuals who committed other crimes the ability to be able to get a second chance, clear their records so they can apply for jobs. It does not serve the community any positive good to, to as the mayor put it, to have a village forgive you after six years and your community refuse to forgive you after 17. We've got to get them to be fully employed so they can assist in, in growing this economy. So I'm hoping, and I want to thank the judiciary because we've been working on this for a long time. I've spoken to uh, uh, Judge Mike Bredalio and the presiding judge. And the great thing was, was that now the general was the one that established the drug court and she understands that the success of the drug court and it was a lot easier. In the past I've had difficulty trying to convince other people that 
there was some value in this in this legislation, and so I was very happy that the general, at least I hope, when I spoke to her, she was supportive of the idea of providing an opportunity for people to apply as long as they've not had a violent offense subsequent or or any other further um, encounters with the law. To to just to be, if they completed the program that they that they had um, in since 1998. Um, if they completed the program, did all everything that they're, and they've stayed clean, they've stayed out of trouble, that they can get their record expunged without having to kiss anybody's hand or anything else to get it a, a pardon, but to just get it because they have complied with the law. And so I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for allowing this bill to be heard. I thank everyone who assisted me over the last 10 years trying to move this through, and I'm hoping that we can get this through during this term of the legislature. But, uh, Senator, the only thing that's saving me now is I became a housewife. I stay home. And that's why I, I appreciate this coming out now so I could get a job. Uh, I tried to get a job the minute I passed everything, but people were reluctant to take me because of the drug charges. Or people were reluctant to take me because mayor, I hate to tell you, mayor, go sweep that, or mayor, go do this. But may, the position really helped me stop getting a job too. So this is the way out. That maybe this time they all will look at me because nothing about drugs. I don't know why that ice now is too strong, but heroin was worse. But people get to know the people that are taking it getting a job. I don't know what's wrong with ice. Is it too cold or what? I cannot know. Uh, I wish I could find a different, but all the people that I help don't even know my name. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mayor, and thank you, Vice Speaker, for your comments on this legislation. Joshua. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I'm Joshua Tenori. I'm the Administrator of the Courts. Um, I would like to present uh, some oral testimony um, but before I do that, if you would allow me, I would like to um, call on Danielle Rossetti, the Clerk of Court for the Superior Court, to read uh, presiding Judge Lamorena's testimony into the record. And then I would like to uh, come back after her. Sure. Good afternoon, Senators. Uh, testimony written by the presiding Judge Alberto C. Lamorena III, addressed to the Honorable Frank B. Uggen, Jr., Chairman on the Committee on Guam U.S. Military Relocation, Public Safety and Judiciary. Dear Chairman Egan, thank you for providing me with the opportunity to testify and to submit written testimony on Bill Number 215-33, an act to add a new item C to Section 67412 of Title IX of the Guam Code Annotated, relative to recognizing the successful rehabilitation and treatment of individuals convicted of first offender drug cases between 1995 and 2005, which was sponsored by Vice Speaker Benjamin J.F. Cruz and Senator Rory J. Respicio. As Bill Number 215-33 furthers the purposes of the Superior Court of Guam's Therapeutic Drug Courts, I support Bill Number 215-33 with two minor amendments. First, the eligibility range date to allow the expungement of records should be changed from January 1, 1998 to December 31, 2005 to January 1, 1995 to December 31, 2005. Upon further review by the Judiciary of Guam of the list of 1,178 cases that may be eligible for expungement, it is possible that convictions in some cases may have been sustained prior to the January 1, 1998 date provided in Bill No. 215-33. As a result, this amendment would ensure that those individuals who completed necessary counseling and drug treatment and sustained a conviction prior to January 1, 1998 also have the opportunity to apply to have their records expunged. Therefore, amending the eligibility date range would merely capture any cases already identified as eligible for possible expungement. The second minor amendment I propose is to merely provide consistency in the language used in Section 1 and Section 2 of Bill No. 215-33 regarding the type of cases that would disqualify an applicant from filing for expungement. Specifically, in Section 1, Legislative Findings and Intent, the language states that it is the intent of Ilihelas 
y legislator en Guajan to, to authorize persons who completed drug treatment prior to the 2005 administrative order creating the drug treatment courts to apply for expungement of their records provided the applicants were not convicted of any other drug offense, violent misdemeanor or felony. For this reason, I propose a minor amendment to the second sentence of Section 2 as follows. Such persons must not have been previously convicted of an offense under Title IX GCA and must otherwise meet all criteria for participation in the current drug court program as set forth in 9 GCA subsection 6741.412 and 67.413, and cannot have been convicted since the drug conviction of any other drug offense, violent misdemeanor, or felony. In the 1990s to early 2000, I presided over 99% of all drug cases filed at the Superior Court of Guam. I saw firsthand the negative effects drugs had, not only on the accused, but also on our community. In response to the drug crisis facing our island, the judiciary recognized that drug courts are an, are an effective system in the rehabilitation and recovery of drug offenders through close court monitoring, regular random drug testing, and holistic drug and alcohol treatment. Although the initial therapeutic drug court process began even prior to 1998, the ability of those who successfully completed drug treatment to dismiss and expunge their records was not available until after 2003 when the adult drug court was implemented. As a result, many successful participants who completed drug treatment and have become productive members of our community are unable to dismiss and expunge their records, hindering their ability to obtain gainful employment. Bill 215-33, with the minor amendments recommended above, will provide fairness by allowing those who successfully rehabilitated prior to December 31, 2005, the same opportunity to have records related to their drug conviction dismissed and expunged. After expungement, these individuals will be able to fairly compete when obtaining employment. Further, allowing these individuals the chance to expunge their records will not only change their lives, but will serve as evidence that through treatment, these individuals are able to continue to remain drug-free. Additionally, I request that no further substantive amendments be made to Bill Number 215-33 beyond my two recommendations stated above. I make this request because a similar bill was introduced about 10 years ago. However, the bill was amended, amended to the extent that it allowed almost every criminal conviction to be dismissed and expunged. For this reason, the bill was later vetoed by the governor. These actions chilled further attempts to introduce this bill until now. Please do not allow this to happen again and sacrifice the opportunity these individuals have to better themselves by expunging their records and thereby improving their lives and their family. In conclusion, I support Bill Number 215-33 with the two minor amendments noted above and ask that no further substantive amendments be made to the bill. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony in support of Bill Number 215-33. Alberto C. Lamarona III, Presiding Judge, Superior Court of Guam. Thank you, Attorney Rosetti. Please extend our appreciation to the Presiding Judge. I apologize for not giving the opportunity to be able to present it himself. Mr. Thank you, uh, Chairman Nuggan. Uh, I, too, on behalf of uh, the judiciary as the administrator of the court, uh, do want to uh, fully support um, this bill as uh, it's introduced and, and with the amendments as uh, provided uh, by the presiding judge. And I'm hopeful that uh, after uh, this legislation is passed and I'm hopeful for uh, um, the governor signing it um, and it's enacted into law, that we would then move in to uh, continue this discussion on, on the issue of second chances. And I wanted to point out and share some data for you. Right now, there are 6,000 people on probation in Guam out of a population of 165,000, which means that one in 27 residents on Guam are on probation compared to the national average, which is one in 52. So you can see that it's almost double um, um, the occurrence is almost double on Guam as it is nationally. Um, and I think that this um, 
discussion and uh, requires some self-evaluation across the board in the criminal justice area. I think uh, as the year goes on and in March, um, you'll see that the public defender and the attorney general's office and the judiciary will um, announce a criminal justice strategic agenda um, in March um, that aims to address some system um, system-wide issues uh, and taking a look at, um, for example, pretrial detention and um, these and the rates of uh, charging conviction are part of that. But um, just narrow, focusing on the group that is um, expunged or the group that has been convicted. Um, I had a recent, um, I was fortunate that I was uh, helping lead a team a couple weeks ago with the presiding judge as the judiciary of Guam uh, starts its planning process in establishing a reentry court. And the reentry court is going to deal with all those that are uh, going to be paroled and all those that are going to be released. Um, and it's going to, in partnership with the parole board and the Department of Corrections, it's going to compel the government really to focus on making some investments in rehabilitation at the corrections department. Um, and I would point out that a lot of the movement coming in, um, unfortunately led by a bipartisan group of folks, it's not very often that you see social conservatives and liberals um, in partnership to address this issue where a large number of citizens of the United States, residents of the states and ter territories are faced with having um, criminal, criminal convictions on their record which have led to underemployment or in many cases unemployment. Um, and I think that um, the policies that occurred in the 90s, um, the three strikes, um, mandatory minimum sentences that have caused the overcrowding of um, institutions in the United States and here in Guam, I think also causes us to take a look and delve deeper into uh, what really is happening um, on Guam. And that's gonna require, I think, um, all of us to be a little bit open-minded um, and also to recognize that I think people do, rec uh, do need a second chance if they're going to be able to rejoin society and become productive citizens. And I think it's, um, so there are some excellent examples uh, that we see nationally that will try and um, work with on Guam. We'll be working with the Council of State Government's Justice Center. Um, they are our provider. We'll be working with the Bureau of Justice Affairs um, and in particular carrying on and taking a look at the opportunities for us to um, really take a look and see what we can do to address true rehabilitation and to try and drop the number of folks that are unemployed and underemployed um, and address this hopelessness that does cause some of this re, uh, recidivism that occurs. It's a big issue. It's gonna, I think it's going to take um, a number of years um, to move. There'll be various elements. Um, this is definitely a great first step. Um, it shouldn't, um, this legislation shouldn't have as much opposition that perhaps it could have had 10 years ago. If you look at the data, Every single family on Guam has somebody in their family that has a drug conviction that, um, that is not being able to be employed. Um, and I think it's something that um, should be part of the general discussion. And after this bill is said and done, I would look, we look forward to working with you in the legislature to continue um, our evaluation of the situation and really try and identify. Um, I, I guess I'll just leave it with, you see all of the failures of the criminal justice system or the missed opportunities at the end when people are released from prison and they don't have anything to do or anywhere to go. And if we take a look at that and take a look on the front side, um, making sure that the judges and the criminal justice system, including the police and prosecutors, um, have tools that are going to be able to be used to screen individuals, identify risk um, level areas, um, and, I'd, and really pinpoint um, you know, what kind of uh, programs, therapy can be done on the front end to try and address some of the, uh, the risk factors and drop the recidivism. And so what you'll see from us is um, you'll see uh, more transparency in the kind of numbers that we're going to be putting out um, and, and, um, and common 
commonly using uh, and using the uh, the data to drive the decision making. Um, but like I said, this is a very first step. This is a big issue that um, I think we need to focus in on. And I want to thank you also for introducing this legislation. I do remember working in the legislature and meeting dozens and dozens of people. And uh, I'll just point out that even the presiding judge himself um, and, and, and talking with people at the governor's office, there are a large number of people that are making requests for pardons. Um, and uh, the volume is so much that um, you know, it does require maybe a really look at the policy and providing that opportunity. So thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Tenorio. Mr. Tadinko. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman, uh, Senator Elgin, and again, uh, good afternoon, Senators, and happy holidays. Uh, on behalf of Attorney General Barrett Anderson and the Office of Attorney General, uh, as you know, and, and I think the Vice Speaker uh, clearly pointed out, Attorney General Barrett Anderson was one of the therapeutic judges with the drug court and uh, fully supports offering this opportunity to those folks that uh, had a drug conviction prior to the, uh, the, uh, the uh, 2005 when, when the law was changed and offered the opportunity for expungement. Uh, and so Attorney General uh, Barrett Anderson has, has asked that I just note, similar to judge the presiding judge, uh, La Morena, that, uh, that there be a minor amendment uh, where I think it's on uh, lines uh, five and six and cannot have been convicted since the con drug conviction of uh, uh, the Attorney General proposes of, of, of any other uh, drug felony or misdemeanor offense involving violence or use of drug or alcohol or, or other substances. This is a minor amendment that she proposes that the legislature uh, consider for this bill. Uh, and uh, and it was also uh, in discussion with some of our drug prosecutors, also consideration that maybe there be language that allows for, uh, for those folks that do obtain expungement that, um, that, it be, that if they commit a uh, subsequent um, drug manufacturing and distribution, that basically is they get convicted of dealing drugs later, that we are we are allowed to use that in consideration for sentencing. And that's the only uh, amendments that we would propose there, especially if we're giving people an opportunity to clear their record, uh, have it expunged, especially if they have no uh, convictions involving drugs or, or violence uh, uh, or substance abuse that, that we fully support that. As you know, we're also a member of the uh, reentry uh, task force that's uh, being formed up. And um, it, it has been alarming if you look since at least since the 2000 that we we received between 3,000 plus police reports a year and we filed between 14 to 2,000 plus cases a year. So, and that's, been, and that's due in part that we can't even get to it, most of them. So uh, certainly strategies that focus like the Lonnie Kate uh, task force trying to focus on the front end how to address the problem before they get into the criminal justice system and then of course the reentry is on the back end and I'm, I'm, I'm certain that you know it's hard to rehabilitate if there's not very if there's minimal rehabilitation going on so uh, I think a focus on uh, providing the um, the commitment in addition to any resources is on the back end as well as the front end because in many ways the court system itself and, and the players that the, the prosecution the police and and the courts we're the we're the middle part the front end is what are the schools and the and, and the parents and the families and the community doing and the back end is what is our our uh, correction system doing to to use the verb correct the uh, behavior and provide them the opportunity. So uh, certainly this will provide those folks who uh, it is in a sense is a second chance bill in and of itself. It gives a second chance to those people who had a prior drug conviction who, but for the fact that that uh, law wasn't changed in time, would have gotten the deferred and would have gotten the expungement. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Dardinko. I'm sure the uh, sponsor of the legislation would be consistent with the presiding judge's suggestion. They consider that as a uh, sufficient amendment <laughs> to the proposal. 
Attorney Miller. Thank you, Senators. Um, Eric Miller, Public Defender's Office. For all the reasons so eloquently stated by all the previous speakers, the Public Defender's Office strongly supports this legislation. Thank you very much, Attorney Miller. Any other comments or Senators, uh, by speaker? Any questions? Senator Munibar, you have a question or comment? Um, Mr. Chair. Uh, before I ask the question, I just want to say happy birthday to Mr. Tenorio. Uh, many blessings. Uh, you're here working on your birthday, and it's good. I, the, the, I guess the question I had was based on the presiding judge's uh, presentation and, uh, and wanting to move the dates uh, back from 1998 to 1995, and he noted that there was 1,178 cases that would be involved. So would that increase, uh, lifting it uh, or, or giving it back to 1995? Would that be more than 1,100 cases, maybe up to 3,000 cases? No, the, the 1,178 is the number with 95, and, and the reason is we have uh, 1,178 separate uh, treatment records of um, individuals that came in through the court um, that completed the therapy programs prior to that administrative order. So originally, um, you know, that 98 date, um, Upon further review of the cases and the times that it was taking to adjudicate, um, you know, we feel strongly that uh, in order to get the to capture the true population, that date needs to go to 95. 95. Yes. So it's still the 1178. Those. That's right. started that far right. back. Right. That's so. That's the the starting point, and of course, we expect the number to that are that is eligible to be less than that, but um, but that's the number of people that actually went through. Um, and that we have the documented uh, rehabilitation program at the court. Okay. Fortunately, we still have those I records. just wanted a clarification to, to make sure. Thank you, and happy birthday. Thank you. Me. Thank you very much, Senator Munavad, and again, happy birthday to uh, Mr. Tenorio. But to everyone, Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year, and thank you for your testimony. The committee will continue to accept written testimony and any of the pieces of legislation that have been entertained this afternoon until close of business Monday, the 5th of January. Thank you again. Thank you, Senators, for joining us.